As we see in today's media, the world is filled with change and uncertainty. Products and services now become obsolete much more quickly than they did even a decade ago. More and more new technologies and new companies emerge, and those that cannot cope with change often find their very existence threatened. We wanted total customer satisfaction, and uh, it, was, it was a result of uh, a officer's meeting uh, about 10 years ago that uh, a bunch of the officers stood up and uh, in front of uh, the chairman and said our quality stinks and uh, if we are really going to be a competitor in this world we have to improve our quality and uh, that's how it all got started what was good enough today probably will not be good enough in the future and so that we have to uh, adapt ourselves to a changing environment uh, a changing customer requirement it took us uh, four to five years to design, develop a product, put it into the manufacturing, and put it into the field. Our competition was, was doing that in three. Uh, when we moved to three, they went to two. When we went to two, they went to, to one. And so you can see the, the intensification uh, of that entire process. Even though increased competition results in a better variety of products and services for customers, it can have negative consequences for companies that fail to meet this challenge. How do you get that sense of urgency across to companies like ourselves that are still in the fat, dumb, and happy stage? Um, we're still making money, and uh, nobody knows the tent's on fire yet. Failure to meet the competition may severely impact the community as well. You get a chance as you drive through to see what it does to, to the community. Uh, it, uh, uh, you'll see boarded up houses, you'll see uh, schools that used to be schools that are now just vacant buildings. The human um, effect of that kind of thing is real. Uh, decline in personal income. Uh, so that uh, is, is an interest of mine. If we can, if we can stop that, turn it around, change it. Uh, and and I, if we can't do that, we'll, it'll spread. We're trying to be the very best we can be. Um, it's hard damn hard. Uh, I'd much rather be a little less than I can be. But competition won't let me do that. Uh, but what it's driving is uh, some of the best in, uh, changes in providing a higher quality of life for uh, the people that work here and the people in, in, in our society and in the entire world. In order to thrive in today's competitive environment, people must seek new ideas it's going to take a whole different look for Americans, whether they're managers or, or people that work in the factory or people that work at McDonald's restaurants or whatever. It's going to take a whole different way of thinking. Instead of being tossed around by a turbulent sea, we need to chart a clear passage through it. We cannot change the wind, but we can trim the sail to get where we want to go. Rather than blaming the environment, we need to develop self-management skills. Self-managing means that we're responsible for our day-to-day -day decisions on our project. They provide us with goals. We try to meet those goals at minimum. We really try to exceed those goals. It provides a real fulfilling satisfaction when you can go in and say, hey, we beat what you said we could do. Instead of me doing all of the directing and the controlling, all the classical things to make things happen, we were able to establish a culture that said, hey, the people nearest to what is happening will make the decisions and make it happen. And it has turned out far beyond any expectations that I could possibly have. In order to best utilize resources at the front line of a company's operation and enable each individual in the company to take charge of his own destiny, this course will address the key elements of shop floor management. The shop floor is where the tire hits the road. And unless we focus on this most critical point to conduct our business, nothing will get done to satisfy our customer. Production is our business. We are a manufacturing organization. So that shop floor, that, that, that production line that we have out there is the most important part of our business. And that's where we need to become more efficient. That's where we need to implement some progressive manufacturing technologies. And that's where our emphasis has been. It's like we were saying, 
on the shop floor, that's where you collect the sins of the whole corporation. You've got, you've got the problems from the supplier, you've got design problems, you've got material problems, you've got workmanship problems, but they all come together on the shop floor. And rather than just point your finger and say, it's not my fault, it came from there, I think that's where it needs to be solved. You need to get together on the shop floor as a team and go out and go back through to whether it's design, supplier, or whatever, and solve the problem from there. To practice self-management, each of us needs to understand our business environment better, be more receptive to forthcoming changes, share information effectively, upgrade our skills, and even be proactive in generating changes for continuous improvement. Increased self-management skills will benefit both individuals and the companies that employ them. By learning to address problems at the source, people will develop a sense of pride in themselves. I think that the shop floor management system is a process uh, where we go out on the floor and join the teams of people that are on the floor and become involved in that process and supply the necessary resources for the people to get the job done the way it should be done. What we do need and what we're trying to achieve at HP is to have more integration on the shop floor, to have more information about customer requirements, to, um, uh, to get feedback as quickly as possible and to reduce cycle time of feedback so, so uh, there can be adjustments in the kind of work that we're doing uh, to meet customer requirements. Traditionally, though many managers paid lip service to the concept of shop floor management, it was not carried out in actual practice. You know, for 75 years, uh, Steelcase has told these people, uh, when you come in in the morning, you can leave your brain at the door and you won't need it. Uh, uh, we'll tell you what to do and how to do it, and don't worry about this guy next to you because uh, you have to worry about yourself. We were never allowed to voice an opinion of our own. We always had to go through channels to be heard. And a lot of times, um, if someone didn't like the idea, they would just kind of forget about it. Nothing would ever come of it. You were told what to do and how to do it and expected to do it that way. And uh, I know, as being a supervisor on the floor, that many of the things that I wanted done in a particular manner never got done that way. But we insisted that it be done that way. We were deluding ourselves, uh, kidding ourselves. During those years, I, I worked real hard, at, but, but all was not right. I mean, there were, time, there were times that I felt uh, small. Uh, insignificant and, and like they said earlier punch the clock do your work and leave and and sometimes that was real tough and I guess I always had a feeling that there was more uh, there's more out there early in this century a book called shop management by Frederick Taylor was published in essence it proposed to treat workers as extensions of machines separating people into those who think and those who work with their hands this is surprising to me but what is even more surprising is that this book was used as a textbook in colleges as late as the 1970s. The question for us is, what is the new vision of shop floor management? The old system is dead. The new system, the self-managed system, is the wave of the future. I feel better about it. Uh, I like the new system. It, it makes me more involved with what I'm doing every day. It's, it's not just coming in and collecting a paycheck anymore. So we're kind of liberating the skills and the knowledge, you know, we've asked these people to kind of leave the, the old days, we'd leave their brains at the door, and now we're asking them to use their brains in, in the process of it. They own their particular process, they own the equipment, uh, they can make changes as far as uh, layout if it's going to improve it, uh, they can uh, make recommendations and uh, they'll be listened to, so uh, we'd like to maybe uh, take that part of it, of running the business and eventually turn that over to them and have the supervisor more as a facilitator coach rather than actually having her to run the place. There's a trust there that, hey, you people come to work every day and you've been maintaining your homes, you've been running a side business. Exactly. Routine. You uh, exactly. keep your checkbook running. We trust you to know how and when to make changes in the workplace, especially if it's something you do every day. Yeah. And so um, you have a blank check if it were to go ahead and put these things in place and try them out yeah. and we'll give you every bit of support that yeah. we can. We've taken our ability in this plant 
to a, a level that's unreal as far as the, uh, the ability of the employees to share what experiences they've had, bring it into their job, and develop that task to a level that we have not seen before. People are not only capable of making decisions, but they can also participate in developing a vision for the future. We spent um, at least three months trying to develop a vision for the plant. A very difficult task. Um, we were talking about uh, how would we feel if we were a, uh, a bulb that's coming into our operation uh, from our glass blowing plant. How would we feel when we came into this? What would we expect? We expected a spotlessly clean receiving area. And as a bulb, you know, we're not concerned, even though the long truck ride might have jarred us. And we ran into areas with robe craftsmen and carefully maintained equipment. We didn't know what our goals were, what our mission was, uh, what our, our objectives were. We didn't know which direction we were going. And uh, since we started this uh, program, okay, uh, everything has come to the surface. Now we know where we're going, what our goals are, what our objectives, and what the company goals are. But taking initiative and setting goals involves changes which are often difficult. We had to make a change. We had to do something significant. Um, we couldn't be satisfied with the traditional way that we were managing. We had to make a significant change in order to survive. It's a struggle, but it's worth it. it it's, you know, it's not easy and to keep all this data and so forth when you got other things to do. It's definitely, you know, sometime distracting, but I think in the long run it'll benefit everybody that's uh, participating in it. Although the change process will vary, patience and perseverance is a key. Change is a very difficult thing. Uh, few people can respond to change positively. Um, so it takes a lot, a lot of patience to create in, that, in people uh, the responsiveness of, of, of looking positively towards change. It takes an enormous amount of emotional input and energy to affect change. And it takes a great deal of consistency uh, and repetition uh, to get anything. It's like trying to, to turn the Queen Mary or a battleship. Explain why change is necessary, because people will change when they understand why. If they understand the consequences that, are, that you're reacting to that will happen if change doesn't take place, then I think that that'll motivate people to make change. And I think in our case, people understood that we're in a business where we need to be able to operate with lower overhead, fewer levels of management, and less cost in the whole management area. And they could understand that staying competitively in a cost situation will, would help that. So we, you know, that's, that helps people want to make change. Although change may bring surprises and can be rewarding, it may not come easily. For so many years, it was a, an antagonistic thing, and now it's a trust. When somebody starts trusting you, it's kind of hard to believe it, you know? But yeah, it, it's helped a lot. So all of a sudden, we ask them for their ideas, their thoughts, their involvement, when just about 10 years ago, we brought them up to say, we'll tell you what to do. Here's how to do it. Here's the tool that you'll use and don't bother telling us how well to do it. And I think that was very difficult, and it took a lot of convincing. But once that person or that group gained your confidence and your trust, it was very easy to attain. You start to see progress. You start to see people grow and accomplish things that you didn't think they could do. I think probably the biggest reward is seeing the growth of the people in the organization. Two years ago, we were like horses. We were blind, we were just walking a path. We didn't know if we were ahead, we were behind. The company was making money or not. We didn't know nothing, we just came here. We worked eight hours and that was it. So then when we started with this new program, you know, the, the, the top management started sharing more information with us. And they got us involved, okay? They got the people involved, and there's been a dramatic change. The purpose of the meeting was trying to come up with areas that, of, of uh, waste that we could tackle and try to, to uh, improve on. And um, 
the supervisor that was conducting the meeting was having a really difficult time trying to get the people to cooperate and come up with ideas. And he kept insisting and insisting, um, come on guys, uh, give me ideas of uh, areas that we could uh, tackle as uh, areas of waste. And finally one person said, said, the biggest waste is this meeting. And that's just an example that now it's a funny example at the time we were very concerned because how do you change that attitude? How do you change the attitude that just because you're sitting down discussing a problem you're, that you are not wasting your time? It was not easy, not easy at all. Once a climate for change has been created, there are challenges, surprises, excitement, and growth. It's exciting. It's nice to see a lot of change. We've gone through some classes on changing paradigms. It's nice to see the company follow through with some of those things so that we don't have to stay the same. We do have growth, we do have potential, and we're able to use that. I fed my own ego by being the answer man for everything and go out and be the spark plug on the floor and make things happen. And I found that with this style of management, what we must do is to turn that around and get that feeling of accomplishment in the hearts of the people that's on the floor. And surprisingly, they take to this like ducks to water if you give them the chance and the opportunity to do it. Uh, since uh, my first day at Honda of America, I've seen a lot of changes and there's been continually been challenges, um, new models, new plants, new lines, uh, engine plant expansion. So uh, the 11 years that I've been here, is, there's been continually growing and, and continued challenges. And it, and it feels good to be a part of that. We may wonder what then are the overall benefits. Here are a few examples. Less scrap and rework. More conformance plant to plant. Lower cost of goods sold. Less past due delivery. Fewer claims on workmen's compensation. Lower overall cost of quality. Faster cycle time. Increased productivity, greater reliability, improved on-time delivery, lower inventory, and increased safety. In addition, there are many unmeasurable benefits. The major benefit I see is, is the, confidence, the feeling of competency that you give the individuals and in, in self-worth. My role is I am becoming much less involved with the day-to-day running of the operation, I'm looking more into long term. Um, what's the operation going to look like in a year, five years? Um, my planning has, has changed from week to week, month to month planning into a yearly, five year planning, so long range planning. Yes, we have improved quality. Yes, we have improved cost. Yes, we have improved delivery, and very dramatically. But those are, again, are, are momentary improvements. And I think what we've been able to do is create an organization that is self-improving and self-organizing and, and are structured into autonomous teams and moving towards a marketplace. So, if competition is fierce, customer needs are changing quickly, and the company has tremendous untapped potential in the people at the shop floor. And if change is necessary, and it is a constant challenge, what does shop floor excellence mean to you? And what is the shared vision of people to move forward? Most importantly is that the change needs to be self-generated, needs to come from within the organization. One of the initial things that must be done in a process of implementing a shop floor management program uh, is to achieve a commitment from the corporate leaders within your company. A key element of that commitment is a clear definition of the destination you're pursuing in the journey to shop floor management. Uh, that definition uh, must be a very clear and concise statement of that end objective. We've taken that statement to be very basic so that every employee within our shop floor can understand the end objective. It is important to do it until we succeed. Also, if we have such an attitude, I am sure we will succeed.